Um, welcome back, everyone. I just want to see... Can we see if we can just bring John Curtis up on the screen? Because I am aware that on a morning like... Hello, John. Can you see us okay? John, yeah, I'm... Yeah, fine, thanks. John, I'm, I'm aware... Having worked together before at the BBC, I know what it's like. So if you're John Curtis on a day like this, when the holding screen on the BBC is <laughs> Boris Johnson to resign, at any moment they can go to John to ask him anything for periods of anywhere between two and 20 minutes. So, John, I really appreciate you making the time to talk to us. Um, I'm going to come, Peter, to you in a moment, but I actually might, thought we might just hear from John first. So if you do have to disappear, that's not a problem. John, do you want to just tell us, just first and foremost, where you think the country is on what's happening and unfolding in Downing Street? Well, um, the public made their minds up about Boris Johnson probably just before Christmas. Um, the two uh, fatal things for him so far as the public were concerned, or at least a significant section of the public, was one that um, they did not believe his claims that he was... Uh, uh, not breaking lockdown rules, or at least his claims that he wasn't knowingly breaking the lockdown rules, or at least he certainly should have realised he was uh, breaking lockdown rules. And the second is basically that people believed he was telling a load of porkies. Um, and although um, Downing Street tried to argue that, you know, there are much more important issues facing people like the cost of living crisis in Ukraine, all the rest of it, this was an issue um, that everybody understood and had big emotional resonance for, the, for many people because of the sacrifices they themselves had made during lockdown. Um, Boris's reputation with the public never recovered from uh, what they learned in December and January. Um, and then certainly what we know from the, the bit of party we've had so far is that although hitherto only a minority of those who had actually voted for Boris thought he should stand down, even though many of them shared the two judgments I just talked about, um, it's become clear, it came clear from a couple of opinion polls yesterday, and I see you guys just put something else out again about Conservative members, that even amongst those who voted Conservative in 2019, and according to you guys, even amongst those who are members of the Conservative Party, in the wake of the Chris Pincher uh, uh, affair, um, they now think that he should go. So uh, basically, I would have thought, uh, not to put too fine a point on it, there is probably quite a lot of rejoicing in the country at the moment, uh, certainly amongst those who never voted for the Conservative Party. And there is at least a fair measure of sad resignation, but at least a, a sense of relief that it's all over amongst those who did actually vote Conservative in 2019. And John, what's your best judgment on, in the event that the Prime Minister called a snap election, who wins? Oh, it's a suicide mission. Um, I mean, if you take the opinion polls at the moment, um, there's a seven point Labour lead on average. That's about 250 Conservative seats. We've not had much in the way of polling since the Chris Pinch affair came out, let alone the last 24 hours. I mean, I think a fascinating question is, will the public forget the last 24 hours or will the last 24 hours have created a narrative about the Conservative Party that will hang around its neck between now and the next general election. And that, you know, that's a big, big uncertainty. And it was certainly one of the challenges facing people. Certainly if Boris Johnson hadn't gone this morning, uh, then I think you know, the potential damage to his, uh, long-term damage to his party um, uh, was uh, uh, quite considerable. But you know, uh, the, the truth is that you know, given what's just happened, if Boris Johnson you know, were to succeed in getting a dissolution, um, then, um, uh, the truth, I think 250 seats would be extremely optimistic. Uh, yeah, and then, then I would then say on the back of that, because I kind of put, caught back some of your previous discussion, I think the last 24 hours have illustrated, that although the Fixed Term Parliaments Act clearly had its problems and disadvantages, moving back to the status quo ante is not satisfactory and that we do actually need some rules that constrain the power of the Prime Minister to call an election, and particularly in the current circumstances, if at least it required a vote of the House of Commons to achieve a dissolution, then we know perfectly well that Boris Johnson would not have been able to pose that threat in the first place. So I think you know, the first constitutional question, that can't, well, I think two, two constitutional questions arise out of, out of uh, what's happened. One is that we do need some formal rules about dissolution. Indeed, we need some formal rules about prorogation. And the second is I think we do actually need a formal process by which a prime minister is elected by the House of Commons uh, we already have these processes for the devolved administrations, and then it makes it very clear 
that the authority of a prime minister rests on the fact that they have been elected by the House of Commons and not on the back of specious arguments about mandates, personal mandates achieved through a general election. So I think you know, two, two uh, constitutional uh, lacunae um, that we do badly need to deal with. One, basically, at least trying to fix the problem the fixed terms parliament act, and the second, you know, a lacunae that's been there throughout our politics um, about how people actually become prime minister in the first place. John, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm going to bring Peter, because I'd, I'd love to make, if you like, that the main area of our conversation, what are the long-term changes, but, but just pick up, Peter, if you would, we talked about it before we got started. I mean, you broadly agree with John that the Tories lose if they go to the polls yeah. now. Uh, it, I, I, John's right, it would be suicide. I, you know, I, I hesitate to disagree with John, I've known for, what, 40 years, and I pretty well always defer to him if I'm in a slightly different position. All I would say is, if you change the dissolution rules so that Parliament must vote by a simple majority, any opposition party will always vote for an early election. So if Johnson were now under different rules, to go to Parliament and say, I'd like a new election. He would only need, what, 40 or 50 Tory MPs, the real hardliners, to join with Labour, SNP, Lib Dems, and there'd be a majority of the election. I think under the fixed-term Parliament rules, I think it was a two-thirds majority. Yes. And, and yes, that, yes. that would, a bar that high, Is yeah, it... I, I think it would make sense. But could, could you sort of broader question, mm, and yeah. the, the point that we touched on with Gina yeah. Miller just now a yeah. little bit, which was the, the underlying trust in politics yeah. question and, and where we are. And I just sort of looking at John now, I was thinking to myself, financial mm. crisis, mm. MPs' expenses, Brexit, the, ref, the uh, three yeah. referendums, and now this. Right? Th this yeah. where I can't remember people laughing so much sure. at our politics. It, you talk about it externally, but inside yeah. the country, you know, people have been laughing. Yeah. What's the cumulative impact of that, do you think, Peter? Right, I'm going to, with our polls, I'm, I'm fascinating stuff on this, but may I make, as a sort of throat clearing introductory point, following the last session, um, a century ago, a new constitution was written, which at the time was regarded, I think rightly, as probably the best representation of all the advances of thinking and democratic thinking to the late 19th and early 20th century. It, it, it talked about, um, human rights, uh, gender equality, free speech, independent judiciary, a fair voting system. It was a constitution for Weimar Germany. So maybe the right constitution doesn't solve all our problems. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I would say, and perhaps we can discuss this later in the session, although, you know, I, I think there are, you, you, there are three things to fix uh, fundamentally, and I think you've got to fix them all. One of the rules, and I think, you know, I think whether you have a written constitution or whatever, I think the rules are broken. But you also need a, a healthy political culture, and you also need a reasonably successful economic and social environment. And so going back, as it were, less flippantly to the Weimar point, great constitution, but crap political culture and terrible economic and social conditions. Mm -hmm. And those, you know, no rules, however good, the constitution, however perfect, can withstand a weak culture and economic and social failure. So coming back to your point, James, about trust, I think one of the things we've seen um, culminating in deep distrust of, of, of politicians and, and of politics is, you know, actually 10, now 14 years of austerity, strong living standards, people feeling hard done by. So we started off in our, our, our research with, with focus groups, and, and, and this brought out really two big themes. One is people feel a complete distance from the political process. They're pessimistic about it. Uh, they don't trust MPs. They feel they have little power. They feel things are done. Yeah. And Peter, Peter, can I just interrupt you a second? Just for, just for people here, because right. I thought one of the things that was really, really wonderful for mm. me about the process mm. of working with you on this is lifting the lid on how polling works and so just how you got here. So will you just run us through the of process of, get, of how you got here first? Yeah. James gave me a wonderful but daunting challenge to say, you know, what do people really think about democracy? Um, it's a bit like that bit in Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. If you ask them to write a piece about America, they can't do it. So eventually, they can write a piece about the, a brick wall, I think it was, or a Los Angeles <laughs> court building. You know, it's much easier to do a narrowly defined thing than to have a really big um, That's Peter um, saying challenge. it was a very woolly idea. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't put it like that at all. Um, 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 
so what we did, well, I came up with some you know, ideas, some scoping it, but something like this. You, in order to ask the right questions in the right words, and words of something like democracy really matter, um, you need to find out how ordinary people just talk about things. So we started off with a series of focus groups. You wanted to find out the, the, the sense of where people were on our democracy and, and its failings and its issues. But as much as anything, the way they talked about it, not just as were well, the substance of what they said. So we could ask questions which reflected you know, the words and phrases that people use in the dog and duck. Um, you, know, um, you know, so you will not find in this um, uh, in the quantitative survey that followed, you will not find terms like proportional representation um, or, 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 or the Lassell's principles. Um, you know, really, is no point in in, in that. Um, but the focus groups also brought out some, as it were, big themes, which also helped us to, to direct the quantitative um, questions. So that was, you know, so there was this issue of, of, of distance, alienation, distrust. But the second thing was, it was quite clearly, for the great many people, linked with how their own lives are now. It is a, it, they, well, you don't find many normal people talking about democracy in terms of theoretical principles talking about it in terms of how their lives are, right? Which is why I said that in order to have a healthy democracy, you need not just the rules and the culture, but you also need a reasonably healthy economic and yeah. social environment, because if people you know, aren't feeling reasonably um, comfortable and, and protected and insured, and you know, when they get old or when they get ill or when the kids need to go to school, if these things aren't working, you, know, it, it, you don't have a society that, 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 um, that functions. Um, so from that, we moved to um, the, the, the full survey. And you know, this is not the first time I've looked at Choose Democracy, but I have to say, uh, I, I was still surprised by the degree of hostility, distrust, um, alienation. Only half the public think Britain is, bas is basically has a decent democracy. Um, I think we, we normally think ourselves as being, being proud of. Um, uh, one of the w worst things, if we give people a list of things about Britain, which are the best, which are the worst, well, we say the quality of our MP MP MPs, it comes almost bottom in terms of the best things and almost top when you talk, ask about the, the worst things. Um, the public are not, on the whole, followers of Edmund Burke. <laughs> that they do not believe that you elect MPs to use their judgment in debate in Westminster to come to the a conclusion that's what's best for Britain. They want their MPs to do what local voters think. What it really means is I want my MP to do what I think. Mm -hmm. um, um, and, and they don't really have any time for the idea that, you know, if an MP immersed in Westminster um, and... and hopefully, at least sometimes, taking the trouble to look in detail at the issues comes to a different conclusion. You don't say, oh, they don't say, fair enough. No, they say, I want them to do um, what, what, what I want. Um, uh, and the thing that terrified me most is, is we offered people two options. And I, I, if you forgive me, I'll read them out because I think the numbers only make sense if you hear, because I think we put it in a, in a really very hard way. Um, we... Uh, um, yeah, um, option one, Britain these days needs a strong leader who can take and implement big decisions without having to consult Parliament. Option one. Option two, it is dangerous to give leaders too much power. It is better for Parliament to debate and sometimes amend government proposals, even if this takes more time. I hope you agree in the space of a reasonably few words. We put two as our distinct views. Now, most people want Parliament, but it's only 64%, 30%, you know, pretty well a third of the public, something like 14 million people go for that strong leader approach. Um, I find that terrifying. And, is, and can I just ask you, is mm. that historically different? I mean, the one thing that we, we haven't managed to find, have we, mm. is, is a question asked in the 70s that was along similar lines. I, that, that, that's right. I, I mean, uh, if you go back more than about 15 years, polling, there was much less polling. Polling was a much more expensive business. Um, and, um, I, I mean, I don't know if John um, is still with us. He, he may have 
um, historic enemy. I mean, the, I don't know this precise question has been asked before because I wrote it. Yeah. Um, but I had, and I did try and look at past um, historic Gallup data, which goes back to the 1930s, and some Ipsos Mori stuff, which goes back to, to the 70s. And I'd not found anything um, equivalent to this, and nothing, uh, certainly nothing as stark, where there have been questions um, which have been asked. Um, uh, from the YouGov data going back now 20 years, um, it does seem as if there was a, 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 a sort of a, a, a move down from about the mid noughties mm -hmm. um, And um, part of it is linked to the questions about MPs' um, expenses um, and, uh, and, and, and the distrust has been um, growing uh, ever since. Um, let me make a couple other points about that. Although politicians get it in the neck, they're not the only people. Business leaders are also distrusted. So, so that this, so people's distrust of politicians is a, is a part of a wider set of people with power, um, and it's not purely um, uh, on its own. Secondly, there is uh, there is some evidence that people are um, less critical of their local MP than they are of MPs generally. Mm -hmm. And you get this again in public services to some extent. Um, it varies a bit. Uh, it, people like their own, their own local schools and hospitals, but they don't necessarily trust the people who run the education um, or, 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 or health system. Um, so there is some mismatch there. Although, oddly enough, um, if you ask people what should be done locally, what should be done nationally, um, if you put something like, um, should you take, should, you know, people like local decisions, but when you say, okay, so would you like a local decision on what drugs you prescribe within an overall budget, or do you want national standards set centrally? People overwhelmingly want standards set nationally. They're scared of local, local decisions decision. depriving them of something they might get somewhere um, else, the so-called postcode lottery. So, you know, people in principle like decisions playing close to them, but when you start putting hard cases to them, mm, it starts to fracture. So do you think, just out of interest, Peter, do you think that the Blair Institute proposal on a much more devolved health service is going to be quite instinctively unpopular? Um, I think it depends what you mean by devolution and how it operates. Um, it, it, um, if you follow the, I mean, I, I'm not an expert on this. Maybe there are people here who, who, can, who can build on or indeed contradict what, what, what I say. Um, but if the argument is that the, the NHS is too monolithic in the way it is managed, yeah. and if you give local managers more power over um, you know, the, the way the local hospital is run, the relationship between hospitals and, and, and primary care and so on, that's one thing. But if you say, should specific rights over things like drugs or access to operations, if these should be decided um, locally, you know, I, 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 that the public, as the minutes you get the first story in the mail or the Times or the Mirror or whatever, of somebody in Wolverhampton getting a, being denied uh, an operation, then getting Wokingham, you're in trouble. trouble. John, uh, I don't know whether you're still there or you've had to, to run. Are you there, John? Uh, yes, I'm here. John, over the years, over probably 10 years or so, I think it felt, it's felt as though we've had conversation about really structural changes in the makeup of the electorate. So divisions, not just within the four nations of the UK, but young and old, um, levels of education, um, cities versus um, not cities, regions. <laughs> Across that whole picture, how much has confidence in democracy, belief in our politics fundamentally shifted? OK, there's an important point behind your question, which may be uncomfortable for uh, some of the people in the audience, if I can guess quite probably uh, where many of them uh, rest on the Brexit issue. So um, one of the things that I've been able to do with British social attitudes is, you're, Peter's right, the particular question he asked, it's not been asked regularly, but certainly a question about uh, how well effectively Britain, uh, Britain's democracy is working. There's a long time series going all the way back to the Kilbrandon Commission on the Constitution of the late 1970s. And British social attitudes has certainly also been asking people about uh, trusting politicians and uh, 
are trusting governments to put the national interests first. And the truth is that the, the Brexit debate has had an impact on not just the levels of trust, but also on who trusts. So if you go back to before the 2016 EU referendum, those people who at that stage you would classify as being Eurosceptic, and therefore by extension people who uh, had less in the way of educational qualifications, were more likely to say they uh, didn't think government was being run effectively and were less likely to trust governments to put the national interest first. Um, when we get to the middle of 2019, about which I think there is an important lesson about Peter's dichotomy that I'll come back to. At that point, everybody thought that British government was being run badly and they didn't trust the government. But once Brexit was delivered, you, what you actually discover is actually a recovery, um, you know, back to the kinds of levels we had before, nothing dramatic, but a recovery in the overall level of trust and confidence in government. But it's one in which now those who had voted leave, those who were Eurosceptic, were more likely to think uh, that, uh, to say they had trust and confidence in government, whereas those who'd voted remain were not. So therefore, as a result, for example, uh, you now have a situation where graduates are less likely to have confidence in how we are governed uh, than are those in less of educational qualifications, because that re reflects uh, the Brexit divide. So two points follow from that. What, one is that in the end, evaluations of trust in government and confidence in institutions are almost inevitably clouded by what those what, by what those institutions deliver. So when the British government delivered Brexit, something that at least half the public were, were keen on, that half of the public at least said, oh, actually, we're not being governed so badly after all. Um, and again, if you go back, you know, similar vein in much narrow uh, 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 timescape, go back to the prorogation round of September 2019, um, and I, do, did people think it was right or what was wrong? Well, Leave voters thought, it, thought that Boris Johnson was entirely right and Remain voters thought he was uh, entirely wrong. Remain voters had confidence in Parliament, Leave voters did not. So again, very clear example that, you know, I'm afraid people don't have views about mm. democratic processes that are independent of the outcomes, which perhaps is a slightly different way of one thing that... Peter was, was, was talking about how it also managed people's lives. But then coming back to 2019, and Peter's saying, well, you know, 60% of people think Parliament matters and 40% say, well, actually, let's have a strong leader. Um, there, there's some, another project going on at the moment. I don't know if you've been in contact at all, but um, Ian Renwick and the Constitution have also been doing a lot of work about people's attitudes towards democracy, including running a citizens' assembly. And one, what that citizens' assembly comes up with, it comes up with all sorts of uh, mechanisms for basically rules for tightening up the processes of 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 how we are govern of how we're governing, including things like should uh, uh, the Commons have to vote before you before you dissolve. But it's worth remembering back in 2019 when Parliament was really powerful, was really saying to the government, "No, you can't do what you want to do." Everybody on all sides were throwing up their hands in horror and saying. You know, this is awful, this is terrible, government isn't, isn't achieving anything. So while on the one hand, we might as a policy, you know, want our government kept in check, actually, when governments really are kept in check, and as a result, we get close to what the French would have called immobilizing, we go, hang on, no, 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 actually, we do need something a bit stronger. So um, we have to be aware here that the, while on the one hand, we do apparently want process to be followed, we don't want that process to be one that at the end of the day means we end up with a, a stalemate in which decisions can't be made, which, of course, is what happened during the course of the 2019 Parliament. And, John, can I just follow up with two questions on that? One is the, the picture you paint of, if you like, a flip in graduate trust of institutions, government and democracy since 2016. I know nothing is permanent, but those kinds of changes... Are they generational? Do they last for a decade? What's your read on how fundamental the shift is in public faith and confidence in democracy? Well, um, it depends a little bit now on what, how people perceive the consequences of Brexit. Um, the Brexit divide is still with us in the public. I mean, although neither Labour nor the Democrats want to talk about it, the honest truth is we're still divided absolutely down the middle on, uh, on the issue of the principle 
by the course and, of the and opinions you know, are the issue at the moment is not being politicized. So the truth is that for the time being, at least, you know, Remain voters have not accommodated themselves to the so-called reality of Brexit. Um, and to and that I'm extent, at least, it's likely this, this, this division is going to be perpetuated. And John, just out of interest, how many Leave voters are having second thoughts? Uh, not very many. The crucial group are those who did not vote in 2016. All right, but basically, the, the proportion of Leave voters who would now vote to rejoin the EU is roughly similar to the proportion of Remain voters who would vote to stay out. All right, the crucial group are those people who didn't vote in 2016, and which consists of two groups of people. One is people who could have voted in 2016 but didn't, and they are, you know, on balance, more, more the more inclined to feel that we should be inside the EU. But the other group. This comes back, of course, to the age profile of the Brexit divide. The people who've come of age since 2016 are very, very strongly pro being inside the European Union. And the, br the brutal truth is, is unless those on the Brexit side of the argument can persuade at least those people who are now middle aged uh, that actually Brexit is a good idea, the, the electorate for uh, being outside the European Union is just gradually going to die out in much the same, by the way, just to make sure we don't forget this other major question that faces the United Kingdom. Uh, unless unionists can persuade at least the Middle Asian people in Scotland uh, that Scotland should remain inside the United Kingdom, support for the union north of the border is also just going to literally die out because in the wake of Brexit, the relationship between support for independence and age is now much stronger than it was in 2014. So uh, on both these issues, we are talking about mandates from 2014 and 2016 that are now at risk of becoming out of date because of the strong relationship between age and people's attitudes towards these two issues. Uh, John, that was my second question. What's your read? It's quite hard, as you know, we in London really struggle to wrap our heads around the reality of what a referendum process in Scotland and the politics of it means. What's your read on what does or doesn't happen next year, does or doesn't happen in terms of a second referendum in Scotland in the 2020s? Well, one of the things you may not have noticed did happen last night, apart from uh, the sacking of Michael Gove and uh, another set of Minister of Resignations, is that Boris Johnson responded to Nicola Sturgeon's formal request for a Section 30 order saying no. So that Part uh, that, you know, as it were, Nicola Sturgeon's plan is over. So we will now get uh, an attempt by the Scottish government, and it's already been lodged with the Supreme Court. They will now be looking to the Supreme Court to judge on the legality of the uh, of an attempt by the Scottish Parliament on its own to hold a referendum on the subject, um, and that um, you know that that will be pursued. Um, um, it's a, it's a long-running debate as to whether or not this could or couldn't happen. Um, you know, when two or three public lawyers were gathered together when this was first debated over a decade ago, you got five or six different opinions. Um, so the attempt will be made, I think the balance of expectation is that it will get thrown out, um, in which case, indeed, we will then go to the, 20, the, the next UK general election as probably the crucial point. Now, Nicola Sturgeon's point is, well, I'm going to say that the... Um, uh, election in Scotland uh, will be a referendum on uh, independence. One thing you have to realise is that elections in Scotland are already quasi-referendums. The, the relationship between uh, attitudes towards the constitutional position and how people vote in Scotland uh, is now almost perfect. Indeed, I would now argue that Scotland is more polarised politically now on, the, on, it, on its constitutional question than Northern Ireland is on it. it a uh, devolved election last year, between 85 and 90 percent of people who are currently in favour of independence voted for the SNP, and less than 10 percent of those people who are opposed to independence voted uh, uh, for the SNP. So Nicola Sturgeon, in truth, is simply telling you what the electorate is already doing. They are voting for, on that basis. Now, given that the uh, nationalist vote in Scotland is largely aggregated inside the SNP, the unionist vote is fragmented, then you know, the SNP will, will, will certainly dominate, continue to dominate Scotland's representation at Westminster. Whether they can get 50% of the vote or not is perhaps another issue. But then the other thing, we, you know, we are then, you know, why does 2024 matter? And I know 
Peter's been talking about this in, in other fora, is that if indeed we end up with a hung parliament, and if indeed the SNP hold the balance of power, my view is that in those circumstances, the SNP will make it impossible for anybody to be able to sustain the administration other than a grand coalition, unless they are given at least some kind of referendum on independence. Um, you have to understand that virtually everybody who voted for Nicola Sturgeon last year is in favor of independence and wants a referendum. And she could no more abandon trying to pursue independence than Boris Johnson could after the 2019 general election have abandoned the pursuit of Brexit. They are both the prisoners of their electorates, but the SNP now, given the character of their electorate, cannot possibly uh, not to try to maximise the leverage that they might have in a future uh, UK parliament. John, thank you. Peter? Yeah, um, picking up John's last point, I agree absolutely. This is what the SNP would do if it held the balance of power. But my belief is that it would, at least in the short run, come to nothing. And here's why. If there is um, a hung parliament, even if Labour is the second largest party, the Conservatives, the Conservatives probably need around 315 seats to carry on at all. Because the only other support you might have would be the DUP, possibly, and then maybe down to, what, five of them. Um, so, so let's say the Tories had 300 seats, well short of the number they could carry on with. They will be defeated on the Queen's speech vote. The Conservative Prime Minister, I think, will be forced to resign. And let's say on the, and this is, a, for instance, not a prediction, but if, say, Labour on those numbers has, say, 260, um, Keir Starmer or whoever, courtesy of the Durham Police, is the leader of the <laughs> Labour Party at, at the time, I would be invited to form a government. So we'll then say, Nicholas Sturgeon will say, we demand a referendum. The Lib Dems will say, we demand electoral reform. And the Labour, new Labour Prime Minister, will, I think, tell both of them to get lost. Now, forgive me a little bit of history. I'm one of the very few people who remembers it and one of the relatives, if he was even alive at the time. When Heath fell in February 74, it was a hung parliament, February, the three-day week election. Um, Labour was just the largest party, but the point is both parties were short of a majority. Heath tried over the weekend to do a deal with the Liberals, with Jeremy Thorpe, failed, Thorpe wouldn't do it. So on, I think, the Monday, Heath resigned, the Queen invited Wilson to form a government. And the papers were full of all the equivalent, you know, hung parliament, bargaining power, balance of power, all that stuff. And Wilson just ignored all that. And the reason was he had a constitutional advisor, a guy I, I knew well, so I ended up writing a book with him, Norman Crowther Hunt, Lord Crowther Hunt. And on behalf of Wilson, he went to the palace and said, if Wilson gets defeated on the Queen's speech and asks you for a dissolution and a fresh election, would Her Majesty grant it? And the answer actually comes back to the Lassell's principles we talked about about an hour ago. Under the Lassell's principles, it was quite clear yeah. that Wilson would be entitled to a fresh election. That was the answer that went back. Uh, this was, uh, uh, Wilson made a slightly cryptic speech, but the word got through to the Tories. So the Tories faced the tactical decision should they try and bring down a government a fortnight after the election, or would they look so bad in the eyes of the public that by provoking a second election, they'd be wiped yeah. out? That was what they decided. The Tories abstained. The Queen's, Wilson's Queen's speech had one of the biggest majorities any Queen's speech has ever had. And I think the same would apply, even if Labour were the second largest party. The Tories couldn't carry on. Um, the Tories would, at least in the short run, not be willing to provoke an election which might be ruinous for them. And, of course, they might well be in the middle of a leadership election and various problems. But anyway, the Tories in the short run would be off the field. If they're off the field, the SNP and the Lib Dems have no bargaining counter. Their bargaining counter depends on joining forces with the Tories. So I think there would be a second election after somewhere between six and 18 months. But on the basis that it would be a Labour government, by then presumably not doing mad things, trying to demonstrate its competence, and they will be seeking a majority. So the final point, final sentence, forgive me, 
if the second election produces a hung parliament, then all bets are off. Yeah. Then I think you could get into bargainings and, and, and balance of power and all that. But after the first election, it will be a Labour minority government with, with no deals. But yeah, and what we have to remember, therefore, Peter, is in October 1974, actually Howard Wilson's attempt to get an effective governing majority failed, and by 1976, he was having to negotiate yeah. with the Liberals. That, that, that's right. You got a, a majority of three, I remember, in October 74. So in, in immediately uh, they carry on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, but, 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 I, but, so John, I think we're, we're agreeing as were the potentially interesting yeah. and shattering consequences or, or big change consequences would follow the second election, if not the first. Yeah, so but I, I, and I think my point is, Peter, as far as the mm -hmm. SNP are concerned, mm -hmm. they would be willing to precipitate that second election. And you are right. Yeah. It would depend on whether or not the Conservative Party was willing to enable Labour to avoid it. But then, as I said, the one thing that can potentially stop this process is, in effect, some kind of understanding between Labour and the Conservatives. And that is what it's going to require. Good. Yeah. Can, can I, Peter, before, just before mm. we finish, and John, just before we finish, because um, I'm going to hand over in a moment to my colleague Luke Bedema, and we're going to do some future-facing questions on digital democracy mm. and the rights around digital. I, I really like your formula, which is... We need to think about the rules. Mm. We need to think about culture. We need to think about economy and society. Mm. And there's a question which is whether or not the way in which we've kind of leapt into this, talking about electoral reform, mm. talking about written constitutions, is, is just altogether too remote and rarefied. And actually, the mm. real questions around power are about accountability of... Mm police or local health services about the ways in which pay is set in different places, mm. about the way in which local government money is mm. spent. If you were advising an incoming government now and saying, look, we need to change our political mm. culture, forget the rules, we need to change our political culture, what would you suggest needs to be done? Um, I, I, I agree with that. I, uh, I, one of the key points about constitutional history, and I, I, John may well have counterexamples, but I'm fairly confident, is really big constitutional change tends to happen as a result of revolution, civil war, or military catastrophe, yeah. some major existential national crisis. Britain hasn't had one of these since, what, 1688 is perhaps, you know? Um, and, and, and that's one of the reasons why, we, why we're left with this. It's, it, it's not an under, it's a written constitution, which is a loose leaf part work, constantly changing. Um, constitution which responds in small ways to particular um, uh, events so to come to your, your point James um, you know I, I I think there are two reasons for going down the more granular route of, of, of you know, local accountability and, and involving people and, and that sort of agenda uh, the first is um, you know, I think there is clearly from our poll uh, a, a crying need, if, even if it's, it's sort of inchoate, for people to feel closer to the decisions that affect their lives. So I think there is, you know, the, 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 that, that's good. Um, but secondly, you know, we sometimes talk as if we're designing a constitution on a blank sheet of paper for a new country. Yeah. And if we were doing that, of course we wouldn't have a monarchy. You know, of, of course we wouldn't have you know, the, 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 these absurd sort of rules relating judges to politicians and so on. But we're not writing a constitution for a fresh country on a blank piece of paper. We're starting where we are. And I think one of the big lessons of the alternative vote referendum from 11 years ago is, you know, it, are you really going to get the maximum return for your effort as a politician by, by pursuing that. these issues? Yeah. Ali, you wanted to... Yeah, do, you have, do you have a mic? Um, just wanted to say uh, fascinating Actually, thanks for all of you, and thank you for that. But I think uh, we're suffering from what I've coined as acute leadership deficit disorder. <laughs> and we're talking about the engine, and mm. we're not talking about the throughput of the fuel and the characters. Mm. Half of this room are 20 to 30 years old. I would imagine. I'm not in that uh, <laughs> cohort, sadly. Not yet. And 2008 till now is 14 years. Mm. So any of them would have been, you know, six or 16 years old at the time. We are talking about characters, and we're not talking about a water dam that is empty behind, yeah. regardless mm. of what's going through that. Mm. And I'm interested to have your views, because Boris goes pretty Patel with pretty pathetic policies. Mm. So what's the mm. difference? And how are we addressing that 
And one thing is that I come originally from Middle East. I'm a Persian Canadian. We wake up in the morning in that part of the world. We know we are being mm. lied to. Here, yeah. people are surprised that they've been lied to, you know, mm -hmm. as if Iraq war was like, you know, just an episode. And the key question, back to your point from 1688, mm -hmm. is if people of UK wake up in the morning and really look at the sausage factory, mm -hmm. what are the consequences? Yeah, I'm, I, look, it's a good question. I'm going to sort of half on the answer, because you're Persian Canadian. And in, in terms of recent decades, I think the best example, both as an example and in terms of good politics, of a major uh, uh, upheaval was what Canada did in the 1990s when the Liberals returned to power after a period in opposition. Being a progressive party, they were reluctant to clamp down on public spending. On the other hand, it was quite clear that Canada's, you know, um, the, the deficit, public spending, the economy was, uh, was completely skewed. And they did need to reduce this, what government did, both at national and provincial, provincial le level. And what they did was something like a two-year process in which every minister would go around the country, not just making speeches, but papers were done, documents done, on what are the options. Mm. Um, and they had a, a genuine, a genuine politician-led national debate on the size, on the economic size of the state. Uh, what, you know, schools, hospitals, industry, national, provincial decisions, and so on, because, of course, Canada has a more devolved system that, that, than we have. And at the end of that, a, a, a national consensus did emerge. And you, some people, some services lost out. But broadly, the process was accepted, and the Liberals went on to, I think, another three elections. So it does show that, you know, if politicians are open, if they take time, if they actually genuinely communicate with people, you can have a serious and productive national discussion. So one of the things I was just to you, James, and I've been putting in the mix, is not just what the reform should be, but the process of getting uh, yeah. to those reforms. Yeah. John, just a final thought from you. We, we haven't touched on at all the extent to which the realities of what people are dealing with now, inflation, cost of living, changes their attitude to government too. Given what you said earlier about how much your attitude to politics and Westminster is governed by outputs, i.e. Brexit, if they look at governments unable to sort of stop the tide of inflation or energy prices, how does that play into all of this? Well, um... I'll make a couple of points. Um, one is that um, uh, Steve Fisher at Oxford, with whom I work with quite a lot, I hope I'm not misquoting him, but he's done quite a lot of work on, you know, the impact of economic circumstances on the political fortunes of governments. Um, and I think he would probably express the view that the odds on this government being able to survive the current economic crisis politically are probably close to zero, i.e that governments that face this kind of problem don't manage to uh, be able to politically negotiate it. So um, that, that's, you know, that, it, it may well be that this government is going to be the victim of the economic circumstances in which it finds itself. Uh, the second thing I would say, you know, one of the interesting questions obviously that arose out of COVID was, you know, we saw this enormous expansion of the role of the state uh, accompanied by a substantial increase in the tax burden and the question was, well, it, given what the state did during, the, during lockdown, was that going to change our attitude towards the role of the state? Were we now looking for a bigger state? And obviously part of the existential crisis of the Conservative Party at the moment is that many of them want to go back to the status quo ante, so far as uh, how the, conservative, the size of the state under Conservative governments. I have to say to you, despite having done quite a lot of research on, on it during the COVID process. I'm still not sure I know what the answer is. Um, <laughs> our, it was already the case before COVID hit in that the, re, the um, apparent um, reaction to austerity was already in, in evidence and we were getting under the standard measure the British Social Attitudes uses, you know, around two thirds of people saying that, you know, we should increase spending, we should increase taxation. Now, that figure didn't go down much during COVID, but then it didn't go up much either. 
Now, there are various ways of interpreting that. One is that basically, therefore, we've accommodated ourselves to the increased size of the state and we expect it to continue. Um, but, you know, maybe eventually when people catch up with the size of the state, they will reject it. So I think we don't know as yet. And obviously now the, the cost of living crisis afterwards has added to the story. So to be honest, I don't think we know yet whether or not conservative politicians are right in thinking that people want us to go back to the status quo and to, and particularly whether the particular coalition that the Conservatives put together in 2019 are of that view, or whether in fact the discovery of what the state could do during COVID means that actually we do now have a appetite for a bigger state than was the case two or three years ago. I think it's an important question, and I would admit, I don't think I know what the answer is at the moment. James, can I say, so I, you know, I, I can tell you what John says. I, I, I think it's actually relatively simple, and here's the problem. Um, that there's a median voter who wants American tax rates and Scandinavian public services. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and so the, so, the, so the Tories say low tax rates, Labour says generous public services. You can't do yeah. both, and um, you know, I, I, and the, the tracking data that John talks about is, is I think, incredibly important because at least you've got a, you know, you know that movements mean something. But on the whole, I fear slightly cynically, there's a lot of the people who want low taxes. What they mean is, I don't want the government to spend on things that don't mm -hmm. aren't relevant to me. But if the if the low tax voter, most most low tax voters. Um, uh, they're, they're not really uh, willing to uh, have their own pension reduced or their own school spending uh, or to be told you, you, you've you got to buy your own health care. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, and, and it's, it's an unsolved and I'm not sure easily solvable political problem. Yeah. Can, I, can I ask you and John to tell us how to solve that upstream problem? And of leadership. Would, you know, the, the, leadership. The, the quality of people because problem. Because we're talking about the engine, so what's yes. going to happen to the fuel? Yeah. The problem, so, so, so I come in on that. But the, the problem I, well, the way I would describe the, the problem we have is that we've got far too many uh, MPs inside the House of Commons who should have become civil servants. They are very interested in policy. They're often very intelligent about policy. But the one thing that they're not very good at is communicating with the wider public. Um, and in a sense, you know, I mean, Boris Johnson quite rightly posed, posed a question to his party during his attempts to, to try and keep leadership as well. You know, uh, uh, après Marquis, who else is there currently inside the Conservative Parliamentary Party who is capable of reaching out and communicating to the public in the way that Boris Johnson was until the public finally decided they didn't believe him, was mm -hmm. able to do so. And clearly, you know, one of the questions surrounding Sakir Starmer is, look, you know, Brilliant lawyer, forensic mind, but can he actually paint a vision of the world that he wants that gets people excited, etc.? But then equally also, who else is there on the Labour front bench that is able to do that? And of course, one of the things that's true now about our, uh, our MPs is that you know the standard political journey is you know join a conservative or Labour club at your univer at university as a graduate. Uh, go off and work for a think tank or maybe even something as worthy as tortoise. You then become a spad to um, a, 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 an MP or even better, a minister. And then eventually your, uh, your, your lord and mentor helps to find you a safe seat. And then you get your political career inside the House of Commons. Um, and, you know, that is now the standard political career. We are not getting people into the House of Commons, people who, you know, run a business, run a newspaper, been a practice lawyer for many years, etc. Well, Kirstam is an exception there. Um, and it raises a question as to whether or not the skill set of our politicians is actually one is, that, is, that contains the thing that above all the politicians need to be able to do, which is to be able to communicate effectively with the public, both to listen to the public and also to provide them with leadership. And after Boris, who is going to be able to provide that? is, I think, a pretty fundamental question facing the, uh, the certainly the Conservative government. John, John, it definitely is. I, I, I'm smiling, Ali. I, I'm smiling because Andrew Neil did an interview with Charles Moore for us the other day, who obviously has a complicated relationship with Boris Johnson. But he had this phrase, this description of, of young politicians, young Tory politicians making their way into the 
political engine, as you describe it. He described number 10 as a slum of spads. <laughs> and that there'd been such an enormous increase in the number of these spads. So I think that is the, unfortunately, the answer of where that reservoir is today. Probably not the right place. Yeah, do you want to say something? Very quickly. Um, when, when, when John and I were of growing up 60s, 70s, early 80s, <clears throat> the people at the top of politics, most of them, had been through the Second World War. You know, Dennis Healy had been a beach master at Anzio. Anzio. Willie Whitehall had run a military cross in, in, um, in, in, in Normandy. Roy Jenkins was working on code breaking at Bletchley. Harold Wilson was you know, newly graduated, was doing economic planning in the cabinet office. You know, th these were big people who'd been through this shattering experience and who had, did have a genuine belief in peace and democracy. And there was something about what they did and how they re related to each other, which we've lost. The trouble is, the obvious conclusion is, let's have another world war. Um, <laughs> and then 20 years later, we'll have some really mature, uh, rounded <laughs> pol politicians. But to be fair, Nick Clegg, actually, I don't know you remember this, Matt, Nick Clegg's argument about Brexit and the sort of mm. Scorch political earth of Brexit was there would be a new generation of people who would come yeah. through with ambition. But, Here's hoping. But, 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 but my, my, my more serious point is, let's suppose in ten years' time we reconvene and actually things have improved. What's happened? And I would say <clears throat> the one thing that would have would have improved to produce that outcome is economic growth, um, yeah. a sense of prosperity, and therefore a debate about spending economic growth which is a lot easier to have in a sensible manner than the economics of retrenchment and austerity. Matt, Matt I'm going to give you the last word on this before we hand over to Luke. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's the age of vandalism. It is. You see, that's what we're it's living. Direct action. Um, <laughs> uh, well, it was fascinating to listen to uh, two two titans of, of, of the of the trade, and and um, I'm, I'm really not qualified to sum up. But I, I do think it was very interesting. Is the point about outcomes, not processes, being the way to people's hearts is absolutely essential. And I, it's one reason why I'm agnostic as to whether we should have, uh, we should aim to, as it were, draft a codified constitution singular, or look at a series of m potential measures that, that change the way that power is distributed. I mean, already one can hear things that have been mentioned this morning, like we should put the ministerial code on a statutory basis um, and the independent advisor sh on the ministerial code should of course be able to initiate his or her own inquiries and actually it'd be quite nice if there was an independent advisor because the the role is vacant and during the the pincher uh, case you know it's been i was alarmed to discover that the um icgs which is the parliamentary body that looks into bullying and sexual harassment cannot uh, initiate an investigation based on a third party report. Yeah. The victim has to come forward, which makes an sets the hurdle incredibly high. Now, just as an example, that's something that you could you could um, you could alter in a, you know a two paragraph bill. I mean, it's it's, it's it's easy. It might not even require primary legislation. So I'm 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 thinking that that there are lots of quite granular changes to use the word Peter used uh, that could be done quite quickly and could have a disproportionate impact. Um, and just a final thought is I, the one area where I, I disagree with Peter is on what I would say is his tendency towards economic determinism. I do think, of course, the economic environment is important, but I think that the, the, the culture wars that have been weaponized by the Tories are not just an artifice and they're not just a byproduct of economic forces and that any inquiry like this has to take account of nativism, identity politics and so forth. If it doesn't, it is simply misreading the, the, the shape of the modern political landscape. Matt, thank you. Um, we really could go on. Please join me though in thanking Sir John Curtis and Peter Kellner. <laughs> <laughs>